begin by reading a poem by Ruby before. It's one of the greatest and most difficult years of my life. I learned everything is temporary. Moments, feelings, people, flowers. I learned love is about giving, everything, and letting it hurt. I learned vulnerability is always the right choice because it's easy to be cold in a world that makes it so very difficult to remain soft. I learned all things come in twos. Life and death, pain and joy, salt and sugar, me and you. It is the balance of the universe. It has been the year of a hurting so bad but living so good. Making friends out of strangers, making strangers out of friends. Wearing mint chocolate chip ice cream looks just about everything. For the pains that can't, they are always in my mother's arms. We must learn to focus on warm energy, always. Soak our limbs in it and become better lovers to the world. We ever learn to be kind to the most desperate parts of ourselves. This poem is my favorite because it represents me, my life, what I went through. Hello, my name is Natalie Paquette. Like some of you, I have had anxiety and panic attacks since I was little. In fact, my dad says the first time he knew I had anxiety was in kindergarten. In my class, we had a sticker chart for being respectful, responsible, and safe. One day, I decided to cut my stickers in half in the hopes of getting two days worth of stickers in one day to earn a prize quicker. I remember going downstairs in the middle of the night and crying because I did something wrong and couldn't get the thought out of my head. Anxiety has always been my life. I had my first panic attack and the realization of my OCD in sixth grade. I couldn't go upstairs to bed because I had this overwhelming sense of having to fix everything like making sure the blinds in my family room were just right and making sure everything on my dad's desk was in the correct spot. I slept downstairs that night on the couch with my mom. All this anxiety started to spiral to self-harm because when you can't feel emotion, it's better to feel pain than nothing, right? Sixth grade was the first time I tried to cut. When I came clean about to my parents, I was in seventh grade because the cutting became more frequent. I felt like no one was there to take away the pain, so instead, I created more. That's when I started my first EAP session, which stands for Employee Assistant Program. This was a way to test the waters to see if therapy was a good choice. I started seeing a therapist on a regular basis in seventh grade. It felt like the year smiling while I was hurting, despite every nerve in my body wanting to break something or hurt myself, do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, I kept it together the best I could my friends, my family, yet still somehow for me. At the end of seventh grade, things started to spiral into badness. I started having a lot more suicidal thoughts and I, not, things at school were not the best. I was cutting every day and everyone around me, including me, did not know what to do. I felt like I was fighting a battle that had only really just begun. It was May 3rd of my seventh grade year I decided to take the pills. It was an attempt to stop the numbness, an attempt to stop the pain, an attempt to release the overwhelming intense emotion, an attempt to express what's going on inside, an attempt to self-punish, not an attempt to die. When I realized the impact of what I had done, I told my parents, suddenly, there's an ambulance, EMTs, blood drawn, questions asked an emergency room visit, family cheers, and then an admit to Bellum Psychiatric Hospital, where I stayed for the next five days. When I was admitted, I could not stop thinking of what I had done. I thought it was a dream. I wanted it to be a dream. I needed it to be a dream. I felt like it was a disappointment. I didn't want to have to be watched over to be safe. It was definitely one of the worst weeks of my life. That first night in the hospital, I did not sleep at all. My first, my time in the hospital was spent doing different forms of therapy and meetings with a psychiatrist. I want my desk to be empty and for people to slowly forget about me. I did not want to die, I just want to be gone. Everything was still so frustrating. The suicide attempts, the panic attacks, the cutting, all I could think was why. I have an amazing family, great friends, my parents that give me what I need and more. I am an amazing school system with great teachers and staff. So what do I have to be sad about? I felt bad because I had friends who had reason to be sad. I felt guilty that I was going through this. I knew my family had a history of mental illnesses, but I never thought it would affect me this much.
With some more research, I soon began to realize why I was having these feelings. It was because I had a hereditary chemical imbalance in the brain that made me do these things. When I got home from the hospital, I had my first breakdown. I started screaming and yelling. I could not control it. It was not me. The breakdowns got so bad over time that my parents did not know what to do. I moved with another psychiatrist and was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, what my family likes to call it borderline person naturally disorder. <laughs> to help, she suggested a group called DBT, or Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. DBT is a six-month therapy class where I have sessions with the individual therapist and group sessions to learn skills to manage my emotions. In, my, in this group, I learned about mindfulness, meditation, listening to both sides of the story, and thinking rationally. Two days of therapy in one week is a lot. I finally, was, I finally started to be able to figure out my emotions with the skills I learned through DBT. With the mixture of therapy, medication, and many people who supported and suffered with me along the way, I was finally able to see myself thrive. It wasn't easy, but I went from miserable to managing my emotions in just one year. That took a lot of hard work. But I had to figure out some way to manage my emotions by myself at home. Okay. This is sticking a while. It has a column of quotes, a column of people that I trust in numbers, and things I can do besides cutting. You can obviously change what your needs, buy things like can have a rainbow without the rain, my mom and dad's numbers, and to draw things on my wrist so I won't cut. Sometimes I'll even put songs like Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls. If you've never heard it, I'd recommend it if you want to cry. It has helped me to figure out what I should do if I'm in a situation where I don't feel good or safe about my emotions. Oh, you know. okay. <laughs> this brings me to what the school can provide. Don't get me wrong, Mrs. Pierce and Mr. Ames are great, but they are not trained to diagnose students or be their therapist. Speaking from a personal experience, I did not know what I could do to make everything better. Having a psychiatrist or a therapist in sight would be a huge help. According to the Health Resources and Service Administration, over 50% of the world has mental illnesses. 20% of adolescents have severe mental illnesses. It's, just not, it's not just a handful in a school, it's a vast majority. So why, do we have, so why do we not have more support for mental health around America? For one, the government's support, or lack thereof, is disappointing. Even after the Affordable Care Act that's supposed to provide mental health for mental illnesses, barely ever does. The U.S. is facing a shortage of doctors. The mental health professionals has just kept on going down at a much quicker pace. 89.3 million Americans live in designated mental health homes. On the other side, only 55.3 Americans live in similar primary care areas. An adequate reimbursement of the government means less doctors. These are just a couple of the many facts that the government is not doing what they could be doing for mental health. About one million people die from suicide worldwide. That's about one death every 40 seconds. 3,000 deaths in a day. Just because people do not give them a reason to live. For every person who commits suicide, 20 others have attempted. Just because people do not give them the support they needed so desperately. So they decided to take those pills, to grab that rope, to jump off that building. It scares a lot of people because anyone can do it. For some, it's just a medicine cabinet away. Many people don't know what to do when they see someone suffering. You want to tell someone. It does not have to be a, a, a counselor. It could be a trusted teacher or parent. Before you do that, you want to look at signs like talking about having no purpose, acting reckless, and even joking about suicide is, something, is sometimes something you'll look more into. If one of your friends is going through mental illness, don't get mad because they're cutting. Don't make jokes about it or say they're just trying to get attention or say they're overreacting, or one of my personal favorites, it's just hormones. Trust me, we wish it was just hormones. And making jokes and getting mad just makes things worse. And it's definitely not for attention. I not risk everything for more attention. If someone is having a panic attack, breathe with them to calm them down. Try and understand. I don't expect anyone to know what I'm going through, because most of it's very irrational and crazy. But I would love if you would try and understand and to give me a good support system. One thing my friend told me was to use the five cents method. Look around you, find five things you can see, four things you can touch, 
three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. This will distract your mind and calm you down by having a task and using your senses to do things you like. Most of all, make sure you're always standing for the broken and speaking for the silent. I have an amazing support network of family, friends, and teachers, and I still struggle every day with my emotions. Black people do not have two parents, cannot afford therapists or medication. I can't even imagine how hard it is for them. For many in our school, this is their reality. Some things I would suggest is looking breathing techniques up and trying to figure out what's making you feel this way. It could be a hereditary chemical imbalance like mine, or it could be because of life at school, or maybe at home. You have to tell someone. Call mental health outline, or even just tell your parents about it. One of my favorite quotes is by Bob Motley. You'll never realize how strong you are to strong is all you have left. I love this quote because it teaches you that in times of trouble, you, people can help but cannot do the work for you. My dad has taught me one of the most valuable lessons in my life. The only person that can make you happy is you. This year has been one of the best school years of my life. I have so many good friends who have supported and suffered with me along the way, and I have the best teachers in the world this year. Mrs. Stocks, Mr. Andres, Ms. O'Hearn, and Ms. R.G. They remind me to smile each day, and I aspire to be like them. My, my family's helped me so much, especially my grandparents, my mom, my dad, Aunt Tammy, and Uncle Jeff, who have supported me so much. And of course, my cousin Elizabeth does so pure in herself, and I learn from every day. Most of all, I learned to choose joy, joy in life, always. At the end of the day, all you have is yourself, and that has to be enough. Some days it's hard to fight, and you physically ache. Not giving up is the only way to make it better. And sometimes, I want to go back to self-harm. But I've learned that everyone has scars that they don't want to talk about. I know that these words are not going to change your world, but they might make you think twice about changing your life.